Good morning, everybody. Uh, it is with great pleasure to uh, introduce the next speaker. Uh, Ted Phillips, in the last few months, I've known him for, for many years, but in the last few months, has become uh, an incredibly good friend of mine. I talked more to Ted in the last few months than I have my own family. Uh, Ted will be the star of a new show on the History Channel this fall, all on his trace evidence cases. And I'm telling you, this guy is an absolute encyclopedia of knowledge when it comes to uh, UFO-related material. And really, he's a legend in this field. Uh, you guys are in for a big treat. He's here to share his research on many of the trace cases and also a new project that he is working on, which I'm telling you is an unbelievable story. Um, he's a lot of fun. He's one of the funniest guys in the room. And uh, it's great pleasure to introduce to you Ted Phillips. Thank you, John. Luck, Thanks. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> All righty then. I tell you, I have had really uh, a great deal of fun this weekend. Uh, I live kind of like a hermit down at Branson, Missouri, back in the woods, and uh, I've always been that sort of person. And but it's so great to get out and see all you guys that I've known for years and meeting new people that are getting into the field. And it's encouraging to see that because people like me, you need new people coming in. Um, you'll have to excuse me, I had about four hours sleep last night. And I was walking uh, uh, up the lobby and I was thinking, I was watching the people, and I was thinking of uh, Night of the Living Dead, if you've ever seen that. <clears throat> Boy, I don't know why we do this. But, um, anyway, a lot of exciting stuff going on. And um, I have an awful lot of images to show you. Any of you that uh, have attended lectures by me before, have probably noticed I use uh, a tremendous amount of images because one thing I hate is look out in the audience and see everybody in the floor. And if you keep images moving, they tend to stay awake. So it doesn't much matter what I'm saying, which definitely would put you to sleep. <clears throat> but uh, so if I can manipulate this, this high-tech equipment like pushing a space bar, we, uh, we may get to see those. Um, the Center for UFO or for uh, Physical Trace Research, uh, I started in 1998, uh, not as a big deal, but as a, uh, a place to centralize the physical trace cases and uh, not interested in taking over anyone's private case or anything like that, but simply in getting the data into the, uh, the catalog. Um, I love computers when they work. And um, right now I have five old computers, one is working. And uh, so it's, it's, it's kind of a hassle getting the data converted into the computer. I had uh, a nice, long, pleasant conversation with the incoming director of MUFON yesterday. And uh, I've uh, we discussed a number of things, and I've decided that uh, the proper thing to do at this point is, as I go through the trace cases, to make all the reports available for the MUFON files. And so the MUFON files are going to go up by probably around 5,000 cases uh, as I get that material to them. And um, I'm going to try to shake off a bit of the hermit thing and get out a little more. Actually, I really enjoy this. It's a lot of fun. And uh, so we'll have a lot of things going. Um, all of these years of research, and uh, I've 
by and large, been able to maintain a normal personality, sort of. But my dog has serious problems. Um, that's my midget race car, and I drive midgets and sprints. And uh, he's decided that he likes to drive it more than I. And since the dog weighs over 100 pounds, he does pretty well what he wants. So a little bit of abnormal. But he is my uh, animal reaction case specialist. Now, this is a guy that we should never, ever forget, Dr. J. Allen Hynek who was a dear friend for 20 years. And he and I were in Piedmont, Missouri in 1973, and it was the only time in all our running around he ever asked me to take a photo of him. And he spots this motel sign, and uh, he put on his MIB look <coughs> and uh, his pipe and the whole thing. This is. This is my favorite photo of Jay Allen, and I've got photos of him shaking hands with my pet raccoon and all kinds of things, but this is a classic picture. And he really liked it. He really liked this. Okay. After <clears throat> 38 years of investigation and research into cases where objects land or approach very closely to the ground, what do we know? We know that there are 3,162 reported events, which is an extremely fluid figure uh, because I'm taking cases out that turn out to have different answers uh, that don't fit the protocol or entering new ones, so it's ever-changing. Very significantly, and Stan Friedman loves to quote this figure from 91 countries. In those files, 1,307 of the cases are multiple witness. So we have a lot of good, well-witnessed cases. Almost 2,000 of the, of the cases, witnesses were within 100 feet of the UFO. And if you're within 100 feet of something, you can tell if it's a Goodyear blimp or maybe Venus coming down. 1,068 of the observations had a duration of over five minutes, some of them even up to two hours. And uh, that gives you a lot of time to make determinations. And one figure that Stan really loves, 741 involving little critters and uh, the humanoids. And as you look at these cases, by large, the uh, uh, percentage involves little three-foot guys, three and a half, three foot. And that's very consistent all over the planet. Um, what's interesting is that about 2,500 or 80% of the landings took place in rural areas. And not only in rural areas, but the things tend to land on the most isolated part of the farm. My observation would be they don't want to be seen. They don't want to be bothered. When the, uh, the farmer's dogs start barking and the farmer gets up half naked and goes out in the woods approaching this thing, as he nears it, the object doesn't stick around and say anything. It takes off very quickly. If there are little guys outside the object and they spot the farmer, they go inside and away it goes. So there um, does not seem to be the threat that we used to think could exist uh, of the objects. They, they come in, they land, they do whatever they're doing, and they leave. And they're not wanting really to bother folks um, in the landing reports. And a lot of people have asked me, you know, well, you've investigated all these landing sites uh, weren't you afraid of some kind of physical damage handling this, these soil and plant materials? And uh, as you can see, I mean, a 45-year-old guy, look, good condition. <laughs> you can't spot any problems there. But after all these years of uh, studying these reports, uh, what I believe is 
that the reports, and I'm talking fact, not belief, uh, the reports based on the data indicate devices of high technology under intelligent control with considerable mass. So we're talking about structured, constructed, under control objects, not ghosts and goblins. High technology, because no matter what year, what period of time they are observed in and reported, the technology is always beyond that of that time period. I believe that the intelligent control exists because of delicate maneuvering that they've had to do many, many times in, to get into and out of very small areas with a lot of obstacles in their way and of considerable mass because we have done uh, analysis on the imprints that they leave behind. In the old days, the objects were pretty large. They were uh, 18 to 30 feet, classic saucer with three legs. Uh, the egg-shaped objects about 18, 20 feet long with four structured legs. Well, when they would land, of course, the landing pads of those legs would go into the ground leaving imprints. And so we would do compression, soil compression testing of those imprints. And we never tested an imprint that indicated uh, a weight on the part of the object of under eight tons. And in some instances, about 18 tons. So that's the range. Um, and when you're talking about that kind of weight, you're talking about something real. So in 1968, over dinner, Alan Hynek asked me to begin specializing in these cases. And uh, he was a very far thinker. And uh, he said, what would give us the most valuable information in all the types of sightings? And I said, well, maybe radar visual, except we can't get it, generally. And so he settled on the physical trace stuff. and. Uh, I'm amazed at how right he was. Um, over the past 20 years, however, uh, the, the objects, the landing, near landing objects, have changed, and they've changed a great deal. We very infrequently get the reports of the classic metallic saucer, 30 feet in diameter, or the egg-shaped objects landing on legs, occasionally, but not very often anymore. What we're seeing now, the change, is we're dealing with objects one meter or less in diameter. Very small, basketball, beach ball size, and in some cases, uh, baseball size objects. And the trace cases are way, way down over those 20 years. They peaked out in the late 1970s. We were just covered with the things. And I believe part of that, uh, the decrease in uh, reported events is due to um, the fact that the, the sites now are very small, and you might remember that if you're going out to investigate uh, a uh, land case. And what we find mostly now are small, conforming to the size of the object, slightly depressed, or in some cases a pretty hefty depression, um, scorching, and it's very easy to walk by. Uh, you have to look at, uh, which I'm going to make available, uh, photographs of, the, of these new types of sites, and you'll have some idea of what you're looking for. And uh, so it makes the job a little bit more difficult because you could easily go by them. Now, uh, when people say, where is the proof? Uh, this stuff is not real and all that. One case has always stood out in my mind um, in which a couple of boys were out in the yard playing. A two-foot metallic disc came down, straight down, and landed between the two. In other words, it was quite close, and it was daylight. And this thing sat on the ground for a few seconds. It did a couple of rotations. It took off vertically to a height of about 20 feet, stopped and hovered. It then went straight up another 10 feet and hovered, 
and then carefully maneuvered its way around tree limbs and telephone lines and then shot off to the southwest. Now, the really interesting part and significant part of this, not only is it a very close encounter, but a CIC special agent named Charles Victor investigated the case and he found an area two feet in diameter where the ground showed signs of, and I quote, extreme pressure. This from a two foot object. And they said it was about six inches thick. And the significance is this took place on August 11th, 1948. So my question is, who had the technology to do this in 1948? When people want to attribute this stuff to Russia, China, Japan, <laughs> maybe North Korea, um, it just doesn't fit. And that's the way these cases work. The technology is always higher than the time. The small objects also are producing great electromagnetic effects on vehicles of all kinds. Uh, since making a trip uh, with the History Channel to resurrect an old case, and a very, very excellent case, one of the top ten, um, I'm going through the files and I've pulled up over 650 cases in which objects have affected uh, vehicles of all types. And by the time I get to the end of it, it'll be around a thousand. And what I'm doing is I'm bringing in effects very similar to this rehash case to bolster it and to try to understand what kind of object did this and how it did it, uh, creating some very, very odd effects. So stand by, the report eventually will come out and it will be in the MUFON journal. Dwight and I have discussed this. Some of the EM cases have even involved a change in color in the paint on an entire automobile. And you would be surprised how many cases like that have happened. So if you want physical proof, how about an automobile? And there were lots of witness, witnesses to confirm that the object was a different color. And in one case it occurred a man, his wife, and his wife's sister leaving home, and when they came back 45 minutes later, the neighbors see them driving in in a car of a different color. And um, they affect, of course, engines, lights, sometimes take complete control of the vehicle's uh, brakes, steering, acceleration, and sometimes levitate the vehicles a couple of feet to 10 feet off the road. And uh, so it's a fascinating study, and uh, it is quite fun. Now, there are all kinds of landing UFOs. Uh-oh, I just hit the wrong button. Boy, I'm, I'm just like Ken Storch said, if it can happen, it will happen. And if I push enough of these, you'll see nothing. Hello, computer people. <laughs> okay. Not working. I've got, I pulled up this little screen here, whatever that is. Oh, would you come to my house? It's Branson, Missouri. <clears throat> I've got four computers I need you really to look at. So anyway, these are all just various types of uh, objects that have landed, uh, all kinds. You can see the horse that's being levitated. Uh, the levitation cases are, are very interesting. All kinds of uh, various types of physical traces, all kinds of little critters. Beautiful sight in Brazil, beautiful sight in Iowa. This site had eight landing pad indentations inside of it. I don't quite understand that one, but it's a beautiful site. Now this is a case uh, given to me by Alan Hynek many, many years ago. He got a letter from a medical doctor in the United Nations, and it was Ethiopia, 1970. 
and uh, at high noon, beautiful clear skies, no storms, uh, a small red object, and they could hear it coming, tremendous noise, came out of the forest and passed through the village. As it did so, it destroyed buildings, tore out some, some highway pavement, and went through a uh, two-foot concrete wall on this bridge. It traveled on through the village and uh, a distance of about an additional thousand feet, and it stops and it hovers. And now the entire village is seeing this. After hovering for about a minute, it comes back through the village along basically the same trajectory and still has, as the doctor said, enough energy to destroy more buildings. And uh, two people were seriously injured and a young child was killed. And this is, uh, was a uh, cooking utensil. And the interesting thing is that uh, items in the village were not burned. Uh, they were not whipped around like a tornado, but they were crushed. So what do we have here? But this object was very, very small. One of my favorite cases I investigated uh, a number of years ago, Langenberg, Saskatchewan. Farmer's out on his swather one Sunday morning and there's a light rain falling. And he sees a thing like this sitting in the high grass around the slough. And his first thought is that this is a duck blind. Somebody's put a duck blind in there. And so he crawls down off the uh, swather, which would be like a combine. And he steps up on the high ground where it's sitting and he's 15 feet from this object in daylight. There are dark grooves on the surface of the object. It has a wide sort of belt rim around the base and it's turning very rapidly. And he can see the grass under it moving. He goes back to the swather, terrified, gets up in the seat, the swather's running full throttle and he can't shut it down. And suddenly, there are five objects, which he couldn't see because of the elevation of the other four, which ascend in this step formation. That's what they looked like as they ascended. They had two pipe-like extensions with a six-foot column of a white something. They reached the base of the clouds about 300 feet. They formed a perfect north-south formation and disappeared into the clouds. Now, Edwin Fuhrer was a 40-year-old wealthy highly credible uh, witness. And he was so stunned by this um, that he was not going to tell anyone. And when the family came home from church, uh, he went up for lunch. And his mother, as it always happens, could tell something was badly wrong with Edwin. And she pushed him and he finally told him the story. And at that point, his father said, let's go see if they did anything. So he and his father went down. And what they found was five circular rings, the central areas undisturbed, and the, the plants, the tall high grass, had been pushed down with great pressure uh, tightly to the ground. This particular site, um, you can see the two probe marks that come out. He could see while, while he, uh, uh, when he got up on the swather before they ascended, he could see two rods coming out of the uh, number two object. They were turning and they were making grooves in the plants. Now this is, uh, you can see the edge of ring number three and, uh, uh, or four and ring number three. Um, before I go to this one, however, the, uh, I talked to the uh, uh, RMCP or RCMPs uh, who investigated the case, uh, Ron Morier, and they did a very thorough investigation, a lot of photography. They tried rolling a tractor tire in. Of course, it left a track when they rolled it in. And he said uh, there was no entry uh, area or exit area. He said whatever made these rings came out of the air and left the same way. And um, I have to say, I was pretty upset. I went on some website 
And uh, that individual was, is now calling the Langenberg rings crop circles, and they are not, nothing like crop circles. Um, a case I investigated in Missouri, uh, the Cato landing, uh, is extraordinary, and it has almost everything we need in a case. This is a recreation to scale of how the object appeared to seven adult witnesses. At six o'clock in the morning, just after sunrise, the uh, farmer's wife took uh, a young child to the window to show him a wolf or a, a coyote that's always coming into this field. And as she looks out, she sees a circular white something out there. So she calls her husband and then the whole, entire family goes in. And they uh, conclude that it's a piece of cardboard or metal that's blown in overnight. So for two hours, it sits on the ground, a couple of hundred feet from the house. After two hours, uh, the, the uh, uh, owner of the farm decides to go down to a barn, which is just to the left of this object, and start the tractor, go out and get it, and pull it out of the field. And as he reaches the barn and fires the tractor, Everybody on the porch starts screaming. And this thing has raised up 10 feet and is hovering. No sound. And this is what the thing looked like. It was about four feet long. And as it started moving, it went, the house is over here, the people are on the porch, and the object comes up like this. And it passed within about 185 feet, so they got a good look at it. It was rotating from a very light section to a very dark section, no sound. And as it moves on into the sky, as it gains altitude, they then see a large cylindrical object stationary in the sky. And the small object, in ascending, crosses the wind with a right turn, makes a sharp left turn across the wind, and then goes on up and joins with the large cylinder and they fly away. And this is significant because this is a small object that was powered by something. And the red is the uh, flight path, the surface winds, and uh, as you can see, it made some powered turns. Uh, one theory that we looked at could have possibly been a, a balloon. And uh, I talked to the Weather Bureau folks and they said, well, no, when our balloon goes down, it stays down. And uh, so, and not only that, at 185 feet, you could see the instrument package hanging under it, and the shape would be a little different. But so at any rate, I went to uh, the weather station. They had launched a balloon at 6 o'clock that morning, but this thing was already on the ground. And the landing site is 21 miles southeast, uh, and the balloon went due north, so we eliminated that. And Alan checked uh, um, nationally for any, any balloons that might have gone through, and there was nothing. When I arrived there, um, immediately after the thing left, they had found a four-foot uh, landing site. And the uh, deputy sheriff was there minutes after this thing happened, and this is what the site looked like. And the two lower uh, indentations were actually little craters. And the soil was totally dehydrated, very light brown, pure dust. Around that edge of the site, there are large bull nettle plants. They have pretty big leaves. And the bull nettle leaves were curled up as though they'd been exposed to heat. Not fire, but heat. And as if you pried those open, you find the dust blown out of these two little craters and then the leaves were collapsed on this stuff. And, uh, and then this neat little swirling third indentation, um, we did run some thermoluminescence analysis on it, no indication of radiation, and, uh, which is probably why I'm in such good shape, and um, no indication of uh, substantial heating, and yet they were, there was a good deal of some kind of heating. Now this is a photograph of that site taken by Deputy Breeden just minutes after the occurrence, and you can see how bright those two small craters are. 
And uh, so you have a daylight sighting, two hours, seven adult witnesses of tremendous credibility, four-foot object that goes up, joins with a larger object, and uh, physical traces. The only problem was I sent several, several pounds of samples to, uh, to Dr. Heineck, and uh, to the best of my knowledge, they were never, ever tested. And that's a sad part of this kind of research. Okay, the case, uh, I always get questions about Delphos, so I'm gonna kind of quickly go over uh, this thing because it does generate a lot of interest. This is Ron Johnson, his dog, Snowball. And in 1971, Ron is tending his sheep where it says er, uh, Ron, and um, it's after dark. The whole area out there is a shelter belt behind those hog sheds and uh, no lighting at all. And as he is uh, uh, feeding the sheep, his mother calls from 250 feet away at the uh, back door of the home and says, Ron, come to dinner. And Ron yells back, okay, mom. And immediately this thing lights up and starts rumbling. He described it as like the sound of a, uh, an old washing machine out of sync vibrating. And he stands there looking at this thing with his dog. And um, he's standing right here where the sheep sat. And the object is right there where the arrow indicates and you can see the camera tripod sitting. So he's a little less than 40 feet from the object. And this thing is like eight feet across, six feet tall and tremendously bright, and the color's changing. And he said there was something shooting out that looked like flames, and it's rumbling and carrying on. And as he continues to watch, he sees, coming from the base of the object, a luminous spray that is falling towards the ground. And what is so intriguing is that the luminous spray falls four feet and stops. A foot lower on the ground surface, he sees uh, a white fog or haze about an inch or two high forming in a circular pattern. So this is forming from the ground and the spray is coming down, but there is almost a foot of nothing between them. So that's a big question. And this is what the thing looked like the falling glow that didn't reach the ground. After several minutes, uh, and uh, there was always contention about, I always thought that uh, there was a great time difference between what Ron related to and what actually happened. Uh, every time I asked him, and he was pretty difficult to, uh, to get to answer a question, and uh, I, I kept asking, well, how long were you there? How long did you see this? And he would say, oh, four or five minutes. And yet his mother and father watched a 30-minute TV show and half of another one. And so I, uh, as soon as I started determining these things, Alan Heineck and I tried to get Leo Sprinkle uh, to come in and work with this, this boy, and we were never able to uh, make all the connections. But and now he will not subject himself to uh, uh, hypnotic regression or anything. He's terrified of this whole event. And for some reason, the last time I talked to him, he told me, and he believes, that if he tells anybody everything, that they'll come back and get his two kids. And he, f he firmly believes this. Um, so at any rate, after uh, uh, the object suddenly starts moving, and the luminous spray stops. And as it's moving, the sound changes from this rumbling noise to a high-pitched whistling sound. And it goes down through the trees, makes a turn, and ascends over the hog shed. And it was at that point, as it crossed the hog shed, he went totally blind. And I asked him, I said, could you see spots like from a photo flash? He said, just black. And he could hear the sound of the thing receding to the south. 
And in a fairly short time then, he regained his sight. He and the dog ran to the house. He told his parents. His parents ran out. They saw it as like a big, bright worst tub moving away to the south. Over the years, I have, uh, I have found uh, a number of additional witnesses. And uh, those folks in that community don't like to admit that they saw a flying saucer. And so it's pretty hard to get it pulled out. But I'll get into that shortly. After seeing the object, uh, the mother, father, and the boy ran around into the dark shelter belt, and they saw this, a luminous eight-foot ring of soil. So Ron said to his mother, do you have any film in the camera? And she, they ran to the house, and there was one photo left. It was a Polaroid camera. And so they, the three of them went back out to the ring. And I asked her, I said, how bright was the glow produced by this ring? And there was some glowing on nearby trees, the back of the hog shed and the roof of the hog shed. And she said, Ted, you could have read a newspaper by this glow. And I said, well, when you were trying to set the Polaroid to take the picture, could you see it well enough through the viewfinder? And she said, I could see to make the settings on the camera. So that's a lot of light. And uh, so for the first time, we have, as I know of, uh, a photograph of a landing site within five minutes of the ascent of the object. It's pretty significant. This is the camera. And <clears throat> yeah, it's not a great camera, but it did capture that. <coughs> So I have taken this camera using the same film and trying to duplicate the shot that, that Irma got. And my shot is on the right, and as you can see, nothing like the shot that she got. And she did not use a flash. And in my shot, I had to use a flash because the flower on the ground didn't show up real well in the dark. Now, this is a sketch of how the object left the area. There was a, uh, a fallen tree seven inches in diameter along the flight path where it came in and then went out. Broken tree limb, broken eight and a half feet above the ground, twisted and pulled down. It had originally extended out over the ring, and it was on this side, and the object came in like this. Now, to see the difference in the soil, <coughs> The control sample is normal soil taken from the center of the, of the ring site, the hole of the donut, and then the ring soil. You can see a little bit of difference. This is a photo taken 16 hours after the event by Sheriff Enloe, the undersheriff, and a highway patrolman. They saw Snowball the dog refusing to go anywhere near the ring. They then saw the dog running head on into a wooden fence, head on into a wooden barn. Uh, within two weeks, the dog was losing the sight in his right eye. They took the dog to a vet because he was swelling in, on the face. And the veterinarian extracted through the nose a thing about this long, which was alive and was covered with like a billion and a half legs. And uh, of course, the vet had never seen anything like this. And it had affixed itself to the eye and was clear down into this area. The dog, of course, lost the eye. And I saw that thing again in 1998, and it's just as creepy as it was back then. And he will not, he will not let us do any analysis on it, or believe me, it would have been done. Again, it's that thing, if I give it to you, they'll come back. So. When I arrived out there, it was a month later, because we got the report, uh, the Salina Journal uh, went out and did an article, and the Salina Journal uh, copy of it was sent from Salina to uh, a friend of Allen's in Ohio. She then sent it to Allen, and a month later, uh, we're going out there. And <clears throat> it had snowed the night before I arrived, and uh, the uh, air temperature was going up when I arrived at the farm. And this whole area was a mud bog. I mean, pools of water, it was terrible. 
And uh, when I walked out there, not expecting to see that much a month later, I find this perfectly uh, ice-covered, snow-covered ring. And the snow had melted everywhere but on the ring's surface. That's a sketch of the ring. Uh, interesting thing, you note the, the red arrows coming in. Uh, I've had some people say, well, is it possible that they hoaxed this? That the Johnsons poured something on the soil and created it? Number one, you would have had to know Darrell and Ron Johnson. No, they could not have done this. They uh, were Kansas farmers, uh, not interested in high technology or flying saucers. And uh, they, believe me, did not have the ability to generate something that Oak Ridge Nuclear Lab can't identify. And first of all, how would they have known this? Where the red arrows are at, there is a gap in the ring. And it's the only gap in the ring. The ring, if you'll notice, is elongated on the opposite side. Those arrows are the wind direction, which I only learned a couple of days after that from the Weather Bureau. Uh, the Johnson family had no idea what the wind was doing or anything else. And uh, my theory is that as this spray is coming down, it's extremely light in weight. The wind's coming across there and it's sweeping it away from that one section and elongating the spray downwind. And how would the Johnsons have figured out to construct this ring to conform to the wind patterns that would occur that night? Because a reporter was out there looking at the glowing ring as soon as they reported it. And the interesting thing there is, I talked to this reporter on three occasions. I have her on tape and I got her to sign a uh, sworn statement she went out, she saw the ring, she went back home, she got her husband and her adult son. They went out and they saw the ring glowing. And this was the night after the event. It glowed for four evenings. And she swore to this statement. And uh, Phil Class paid a visit to Delphos. And who did Phil talk to? Not the boy who saw it, not the mother who's a pretty smart lady, but Daryl, the father. And number one, he said, you know, Ted Phillips making a lot of money on this case. So here comes the money issue. And uh, he, I mean, he called Daryl a liar to his face. But he took the most controllable witness of the family and tricked him into saying all kinds of really stupid things that no one else in the family would have said. Maybe the boy, but not the mom. And um, so anyway, Phil and I had a lot of long phone conversations. Uh, but at any rate, and by the way, in his book, he says, wouldn't it have been better if Ted Phillips took any control samples while he was there? Well, I had told everyone, and in every report, I had the listing of soil inventory, 19.7 pounds from control samples. And he would only have had to read the articles or the reports or call me. And uh, so at any rate, uh, in my trip out on, in 1998, I went and looked up the reporter who was then in a nursing home. And I said, you remember uh, you and your husband, your son seeing the ring glowing? No, that never happened. Well, I had heard from Irma that Phil Class had offered this woman $10,000 for something and uh, she didn't have any samples, she didn't have anything of value. So I'm saying, well, what in the world could this be? So when I talked to her, and she now, or up until she died, said, no, we never saw the glowing ring or anything with it. So you can put, I think, two and two together. Now, when you would brush the snow off the ring, this is 31 days after the event, you can see the water standing on a very bright, brown, dry surface. And it was quite honestly like pouring water on the surface of an automobile. Would not absorb water, it would beat up on this ring soil, and the rest of the soil in the middle and around is just a mud bog. Droplet of water placed on the ring soil, 
and it had been standing there about six minutes when I took this picture. Recently, after all these years, I took a piece of the material, I put water on it, set up the video camera, turned it on, and stopped recording at an hour, and the droplet was still sitting there. And it will sit there until it evaporates into the air. That's how hydrophobic this stuff is. That's my, uh, my neat lab experiment. I use grass seed, and <clears throat> on the left side I have uh, the ring soil, the normal control soil on the other side. And obviously if you cannot get water into the soil, it's not going to grow much. This is a photo three and a half years after the event. And you can see the gap in the ring, stuff growing in the middle all around, and as you can see the ring has some drastically changed material in it. This has taken seven years after the event. And eventually, Ron became so frightened of this thing, when he moved off the farm, he bulldozed over it with tons and tons of dirt and sealed it. But I have a couple plans in mind for that. Now, this is Ron, Durrell, and Irma, and Snowball. And Earl Farouk at uh, Nottingham University in England did, has done tremendous analysis work on this case, on the soil. And uh, as an analytical chemist, he came up with some terrifically interesting ideas. And of course, they're only ideas, but uh, first of all, he thinks the reason the thing was started glowing uh, was that it had to download this luminous spray, whatever this material was to reduce pressure inside the object, and that the object was having problems and had to come in somewhere very near the ground to get rid of this stuff. Well, that's interesting because you can see the site, and on the farm across the road, the farmer's out, I learned this later, I talked with him before he died, thank goodness, <clears throat> and he was out on his tractor in the field, and he saw the object come out of the Johnson farm fly toward his farm, and it came down and hit the, uh, the field. And he said it was, it was really strange because it was going like this, like it was having trouble getting in the air. And eventually, it was 100 feet from him, and eventually it did get its wings and flew off. 10 miles south of there, the direction it was flying, a uh, auxiliary policeman reported to the sheriff's department a brilliant circular light passing over him. Before uh, Ron's experience north of Delphos, a high school principal saw an object flying south, a very bright light. There was a farmer uh, to the west of, uh, of the Johnson farm um, sitting out on his front porch, and he saw the object come in to the Johnson farm. So there are all kinds of independent witnesses. Unfortunately, most of them are dead, or all of them now. Uh, but it's a tremendous case. And this is class theory number 3,666 on the Delphos ring. And obviously, this looks just like the ring. You know, it looks just like the ring. Um, and one of his other pet theories, I mean, class, if one doesn't seem to fit, he'll go to the next one, or he would, not anymore. Um, thank you. Uh, anyway, the, his, the theory that I really liked was it was a circular feeder. The Johnsons had maliciously put a circular feeder out in a shelter belt, and then, which was open to the north, a field that went on forever, and so, of course, they're going to put all their livestock out there and watch them run off into this endless field and then spend three months catching them. But Phil didn't care about fences or anything like that, didn't know much about farming, probably. And um, so at any rate, they had put this out there. And get this, the animals go to the circular feeder. They all gather around it, and they become very excited as they eat. And they stamp their little feet. And they urinate. The uric acid goes into the soil, and you have a ring, just like this. 
Well, number one, the ring surface, when I ran a profile with trans, or the, a level, the ring's uh, surface was higher than the surrounding soil, not stomped down. And Phyllis Buttinger, God love her, my, one of my best friends, uh, in analysis found no uric acid. So you see, we can prove the skeptics wrong occasionally. Oak Ridge Nuclear Laboratories, the director of the Orion Project, and I am going to run over time, uh, did some electron transmission microscope imaging. This is a very tiny particle of the Delphos soil. The haze you see around it is a ceiling coating. So they increase the magnification, and in that coating they find these structures that they called icicles. And imagine this, Oak Ridge Nuclear Laboratories, and we got a letter saying with the pictures, no one had ever seen structures like this. And uh, then, about a week later, Alan and I got a letter from um, the director of the Project Orion, and at the bottom there, if you can't read it, <clears throat> because of changes in management at Oak Ridge, I regret that I will not be able to conduct any more material analysis for CUFOs. In other words, they were finding something of interest under heavy government contract, and we ain't going to tell you guys. Now, on my uh, uh, second trip to Slovakia, and uh, I've got to rush along and get to that, um, I had just arrived in the Tatra Mountains, and a uh, Slavic family who I've become friends with uh, one morning rushed into uh, my little hut, and uh, they were very excited, and they said, UFO, UFO. So I ran outside, and they said, no, on TV, on TV. And um, on, on Slavic national television, they had ran one time a video of a circular brilliant object that had flown over the new nuclear power plant, which had just gone into operation. The thing came in, dropped down to low level, went over the, uh, the old power plant, which is on the left, and these pictures were taken by me at great risk, believe me. This is the top security installation in Slovakia. At that time, it was heavily under Russian control, and they have a lot of MiG-29s. But it goes over the active stack, and it hovers there for 10 minutes, and then ascends vertically. The cool thing is that when it started coming in, all the security video cameras on the installation start filming. So they had film of this thing in great detail from all kinds of cameras. So I had my friend, the father of this family, call uh, Slavic National TV and ask him if I could get a copy, sure, of this video. And uh, in the meantime, I'm on my way to La Vis to try to find witnesses that uh, can speak a little English. And uh, I found a lot of people that were willing to say, I saw it, yeah, but no details. And uh, the station manager actually did call Mio's back, and of course she said, well, you know, the military took that video, so we're not going to get to see that. Now, this is a recent case, uh, Havana, Cuba. This little guy about four foot across, again, small things going. Uh, touched down and left about a two foot scorched area where it had been. It was seen in daylight by multiple witnesses. And uh, I think I'm more fascinated by these small objects than the, the big old crashy guys that used to be around. Now, since 1998, I've been investigating an area which has a lot of ongoing activity. Two or three times a week, you can see uh, all kinds of occurrences. And I actually, well, I took this photo. And uh, pretty weird stuff. The uh, aerial displays produce all kinds of interesting things. In this one, very briefly, I had set up a, a video camera 
by this windmill to try uh, to capture some of this stuff at night. And the owner of the property every evening would go out, power up the camera, and put in a new videotape and turn the thing on. On this particular evening, um, he and his wife and the caretaker of the place, and this is very isolated, uh, are standing out on the side porch of the cabin, and the caretaker starts screaming, and they look down the valley, and a small white object, very bright, is coming up the valley about 20 feet off the ground. And they're all standing there watching this thing as it goes by 40 feet from them between their location and the windmill and right over my video camera. And so the, uh, the owner was ecstatic. He thought, oh boy, have we got some video. Well, this thing, after it passed over my camera, and it actually dipped down, he said, as it went in front of it. So what video? And it made a supreme left turn just past the cabin, and there was a car leaving with people in it, and it fell in behind and followed the car down the lane. So at any rate, I, uh, uh, I was so excited. This is what it looked like. Um, and he ran out to the camera, and the tape had been ejected from the camera. And I had 15 new tapes stored five feet away inside a little shelter. And this thing totally destroyed the video camera and all of those tapes. And uh, on the tape that was in the camera, actually uh, the recorded part you can see, and that was looking to the north, and suddenly everything goes static and then white. And so we got no video of the object. But these people with 11, 15, 17, 20 witnesses have shot a lot of incredible video um, of these things. And uh, a lot of reports of the small white orbs. Uh, recently, one flew between a couple of lawyers um, who were standing in a cemetery. I know that sounds like a joke, but uh, they're standing in the cemetery, and suddenly they see uh, a whole group of these things come in in front of some trees, and they're moving around each other. Two break off and come towards them. One goes this way and one continues towards them. They're standing 10 feet apart, and it flew between the two people. And they felt nothing, smelled nothing, saw nothing. Well, smelled nothing at the time. But, and the thing went on across the road, out over a field, stopped, hovered, and then flew away. And this is the track that object followed uh, over my camera. God love it. Um, the next field, to the, or farm to the south, has had an equal number of these events. Uh, you're gonna really like this. In between, I'm gonna try this stunning, well, as I might expect. There it comes, you see the cursor there? <laughs> okay. To the right of the cursor is an old uh, trailer. To the left of it is an old house. And the guy that owns this property was currently at that time in a rest home. He is currently nowhere, but uh, the uh, uh, couple who, I'm looking at this 15 minutes remaining, I'm sorry, uh, who lived over at the other end of this arrow, uh, the lady got up to get a drink of water in the middle of the night and uh, the house is all lit up. She runs the window, she sees a structured craft of lights coming down towards the ground, gets her husband, he sees it. It comes in, and they think lands on this farm. And so the next day at noon, the guy and his wife drive over to the farm. And um, they stop the car, the guy gets out, and there's very high weeds. He walks over, checks the trailer, it's okay. Is walking between the trailer and this house, and he suddenly disappears from view uh, to his wife. And she's thinking, oh, my, a heart attack. And uh, so she gets out of the car and she starts screaming at him. And he finally answers her and she says, are you all right? And he says, I don't know. So she goes up and here he is lying face down on the ground and he can't move. And as she reaches him, she is hit on the upper shoulders by two terrific impacts and knocked to the ground by him. And he had gone through the same thing. And... Uh, 
They will not, uh, they refuse any uh, identification. They don't even want to talk about it. It scared them so bad. And he actually, in the fall, uh, had a uh, uh, very serious uh, damage to his leg, uh, developed into a blood clot, and he almost died. And, but before I show you pictures there, you'll notice the two O's over there from X1. Um, he was riding his horse, the owner of the property was riding his horse one afternoon, the horse bolted, and when he gets down and looks around, he finds two 10-foot burned rings. And, you know, he, I mean, he doesn't believe in flying saucers, so he just kind of ignores it. Within a week, he has a calf born, and the calf, calf is perfectly healthy, and the mother uh, is standing there by it. He leaves in the evening, he locks all the gates, you can't get in there. Next morning he comes out, the first thing he checks is a calf. What is left of the calf is a skeleton. No, nothing inside, nothing outside, the mother is still standing there, and five feet away is another 10-foot burned ring. And as you can see, there were a lot of burnt rings over the next two weeks, each with a calf. And this man had a pile of bones uh, of, from similar conditions of cows that you couldn't believe. But he didn't want to be ridiculed, he didn't want to be laughed at, so he didn't report it. And this is one of the 10-foot uh, uh, rings that the horse bolted at, uh, but this has taken quite a long time after the event. This is a ring, uh, an object bright light comes down near the ground and they find the ring. And it is 10 feet in diameter. And this is on the north farm, the first one. Okay, I really got to race this, but this is my uh, premier event. Uh, in all the years I've been working this stuff, this is the single most important thing I've ever been involved in. This is Antonian Hurak. Uh, a Czech engineer with four degrees in engineering, a couple of degrees in business management, speaks seven languages fluently, He's a very was a very bright man. In 1970, I received a call from uh, an investigator with APRO, a friend of mine, and he said, you gotta come out uh, to Denver and talk to my neighbor and listen to this story because uh, this investigator knew that I was a cave explorer and uh, into the physical evidence thing. So I went out, and uh, the wife and I, and we talked with him extensively. He maintained during World War II a diary, daily diary, and it's the best reading. I mean, it's better than anything you've ever read uh, in very great detail. This, was, uh, this, this is his home, was his home in the uh, North Czech Republic, uh, which was then called Bohemia. And this had been in the family for, uh, oh, a long, long time. They had a lot of uh, uh, property. They had timber. They had uranium mines. Uh, Tony sold the first uranium specimens to Madame Curie in the uh, early 20s. And uh, very, very wealthy people until the Nazis decided to take over uh, Czechoslovakia. Um, in 1970, I was looking at these sketches and uh, in his home, and I photographed them directly from the diary. This is two pages. And um, I was so caught up in this story that uh, I called Alan Heinick, and he met Ginger and I in uh, Las Cruces, and I showed him what I had. And then he flew up and talked to Tony. And we were so impressed that we decided we have got to mount some kind of expedition. And so uh, Jim, uh, through Jim and Coral Lorenzen, uh, Jackie Gleason agreed to fund my first trip over there. That would have been in 1970, and unfortunately the Russians had just invaded Czechoslovakia in 68, <clears throat> and we had four contacts that would get me supplies and so on, and the Russians arrested all four and killed them. So that kind of killed the expedition. It was far too dangerous. Now, uh, let me tell you very briefly of what happened to this guy. Uh, when the Nazis took over, they took everything they owned down to his wife's wedding rings, put him in a concentration camp, 
He was there from 39 to 41. He escaped in 41, uh, escaped to Slovakia, and joined the Slavic Underground Army. He was then an army captain, and he had a battalion of 184 men. They were in a heavy firefight with the Germans. All of them were killed except Tony, Martin, and Yuri, and they were left for dead, and Martin with very serious wounds. A sheep man comes along the next day and finds them, treats their wounds, build a stretcher, and took them up into the Tatra Mountains to his cave. The cave had a very small opening, and it was closed up with rocks. The sheep man removes the rocks. They go in, and it turn, opens into a very large uh, entrance room. And here he's going to hide them from the Germans. And he starts going through the holy rites, blessing himself, the cave, and everyone in it, which Tony found kind of unusual. And there was an opening going on back at the end of this room, and he said, please don't go back in my cave because it is haunted and very dangerous. And so Slavic left, and Tony got his rifle, torches, and a carbide light, which I have out at my table, um, and went on back in the cave which is what I would have done. And after going about two miles in the cave, I'll show you through his close-ups of his sketches. Um, he's coming through here. And at that area, he comes into a long level corridor. At the end of the corridor is a crawl space. He comes through there and his view right here of this open, or this wall right here. This is 25 feet across the room, and it's about 30 feet high. And this is the height of a man, to give you some reference. So from this point, looking here, this is what he saw. And what he's seeing is exposed black, satiny, mirror-like material. No seams, no rivets, no anything. And it is framed by very large cave formations. And if you know anything about caving, those formations take a few years to form. Well, right through here, he can see a crack coming down. And where it meets the cave floor, it's just big enough, if he gets naked, he can go through the crack. And if you've ever been in a cave with all those rocks, you don't want to do that. But as he slides through the crack, uh, he can measure the thickness of that outer wall at seven feet thick. He gets through the crack and he rolls down the floor to this point here into the back wall. And what he finds himself in is a large structure that goes up right here, the outer wall, the inner wall. So it's like a vertical shaft, 16 degrees off of vertical. And he could never determine, could never get enough light to find the top. And. Uh, he goes back to the camp to get more supplies, doesn't tell Yurik or uh, Martin about it, and every day he returns a couple of times to this to survey it, to study it, to try to get samples. He fired his military rifle at this point on the wall to try to chip a piece off, and it didn't even scratch this material. And he found by digging right here that this is a limestone accumulation, drippage. And he went down through five feet of this stuff, which means about 6,000 years. Beneath 6,000 years of limestone, he finds the skeleton of a prehistoric cave bear. He takes three of the teeth, which I have, and uh, after the war, he went to uh, a museum in Uzerod, Ukraine, and the curator identified them as prehistoric cave bear. So what we're talking about is 6,000 years of limestone, a cave bear that's been dead, at least 50,000 years, perhaps a million. Beneath the cave bear, it's lying on a curved, wavy grill. And I think, yeah, this is how that appeared. And it went on down, and he thought he could feel heat, so he put his ear and cheek to this grill, and there was considerable heat coming up to it. And far, far below, he can hear what sounds like a turbine engine. And uh, you've got to remember, this is an engineer. This guy, and he had been directors of mines, very familiar with subterranean sounds. 
So it becomes really interesting. What are we dealing with? This is how the thing would appear from above. That's the configuration of it. This is that outer wall, the crack in the room. And he said, without question, these are constructed mathematically curved walls. And um, so he's, he's sitting inside this thing, writing the diary, doing the sketches, and pondering what it might be. And the last thing he wants to see is tomb robbers getting in before scientists. So on the cave map, which he gave me, when he came out the last time, they were going to rejoin their uh, unit uh, in Kosiska, and they had been in there for seven days. Um, he decided that he would obstruct the cave passage where it became crawlways in three places so tomb robbers could not find the artifact if they did find the cave. And without the map, you would never find this thing. And as I say, fortunately, I have the map. This is uh, Dr. Heineck and I and our meeting on the uh, artifact. He then went up and uh, had a long visit with uh, Tony. And they were both from Bohemia, so they hit it off very well. My first trip over there, uh, there's not a great selection of, of uh, rental cars. This is going through village records. This is a manuscript uh, about a crash of a circular object into a mountain very close to the mountain the artifact is in, in 1663. And um, this, is, this is the area. It crashed in this area here. And the villagers from a tiny village went up and carried pieces of this thing down and buried them in the village. And I didn't know this on any of my trips over there, so that's now on my to-do list. And guess who that is, struggling to breathe. This is the area of the cave. That's the Tatra Mountains, a la Google. That's the cave area in the Tatra Mountains, which looks like this. If you're standing at the, uh, the cave site, this is what you see looking, east, north, south, and west. For a young 45-year-old guy, it's a pretty good trip. Now this is taken from inside what I believe may be the cave. If it's not this one, there are two more, and it is one of the three. It's taken inside looking out. Uh, high moisture, which gives you all that fogging. Some collapse in the floor from aerial bombing uh, in early 45. These are uh, some carvings. And the JF is Yurik. And I wouldn't even attempt to pronounce his last name. This uh, Martin, the uh, severely injured soldier, was placed in an alcove. Rocks were heated and placed under him to prevent uh, chilling. And we found about 40 feet of uh, 1940s bandage in there, which I brought back. We found this, and this is basically a calendar. And when you sketch that out, it makes more sense. 23, they went into the cave on October 23rd. Um, this, I believe, is part of the, uh, the cave passage. And then Antonian Hurok. And um, I don't know, it may be a stretch, but it's, it's really interesting. Uh, well, I won't have time to go into this. There is another, or there are two more of these things, possibly, one in Oklahoma and one in uh, uh, Ohio. And they were discovered in 1867 and 1928. And this is a signed testimony of the witness, one of the witnesses from 1928. Um, I've been in touch, emailing with uh, a Russian, two Russian scientists, and they found ancient manuscripts from Siberia where a large black cylindrical object, curved walls, came out of the sky and landed. And this was eons and eons ago. And uh, it made a terrible noise. The villagers, it was so tall they could see it from miles away. Each day it got shorter. So when it finally disappeared, the villagers hopped on reindeers or ATVs, whatever they had back then, and went to the area, no object, but there was a crescent moon-shaped 
chasm that went down, uh, and they have not found the bottom of it. Out of this is coming an electronic signal, pulsing every two seconds. They found another one in Yugoslavia, same pulsing. My second trip, when I was close to the cave, the uh, compasses started going crazy. I put them on the ground with an EM field meter, videotaped them as they pulsed every two seconds. So there may be three of these things. And uh, believe me, it is a fascinating thing. And so my goal is to get back over there before the blizzard start up this year. And um, to help fund this, <laughs> I am hawking CDs that I've made uh, of the, where all the unusual lights and cattle mutilations and so on. That's called the Marley Woods. Uh, I have the 10 best physical trace cases. I have the Tatra or the Cave CD, uh, a Ghost Light CD, and the Cato Landing CD. The full report, all the photos and sketches. So I've never been one to hawk or sell anything relating to this subject because I think it's a little demeaning to the subject. But unfortunately, uh, I want to get back to this thing. So I thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Luckily, I didn't. Oh, thank Yeah, you get into problems when you rush. You've got to rush, you know, and boy, when that 15 minutes came on, it just, boy, it takes so long.